You and I and our church are a part of something a lot bigger than us. We are a part of the church around the world and throughout history that identifies Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We are also part of a network of churches around the world called Wesleyans. We are uh, one of the Wesleyans that kind of stems from the movement that happened with John Wesley in the 1700s beginning in England and is really carried around the world with a lot of hope for a lot of people. And so as part of the Wesleyans, one of the things I really like about the Wesleyan network, and there are a lot of them, but one of them is the way they simply describe what we do. They, there's this sort of catchphrase in the Wesleyan church that says, we, fu we are fulfilling the great commission in the spirit of the great commandment. That's kind of a mouthful, but I like how it just crams so much into those little phrases. We're fulfilling the great commission which is Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And we're fulfilling that in the spirit of the great commandment, which is from Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we have this mission, but we have this way that we do it in, in love. And for us, the most important thing is really the focus on who Jesus is. I, I've said this before, but I don't want us to become a purpose-driven church because if we start by talking about purpose, we've missed the presence of God. And God is really the first thing that we need to talk about. Before anything that we have to do for God, it's just the fact that He loves us and we get to have a relationship with Him. And we, we recognize that God's presence is with us in our life and in our church. That's worth celebrating every day of the year. And when we recognize that God's presence is with us, and that he loves us and we have a real relationship with God, the, almost the natural consequence or flow of that is that we have relationship with each other that should resemble God in some way. In other words, we get to practice loving each other in a community. And I do say practice because practice makes perfect and we're not. But part of being a church is we, we get to come together and get to know one another and have relationships where my imperfections rub up against your imperfections and cause sparks and we both get to become holy in the context of community. Again and again in the New Testament, the phrase love one another is repeated. Love one another. Love one another. We get to practice loving one another. Patrick Lencioni is a best-selling business author. Anybody ever read any of Patrick Lencioni's books? He, um, he wrote a book called Death by Meeting, which I think some of you in corporate world would probably want to buy and give it to your boss. <laughs> Here's how to kill us all in a meeting. And he also wrote a book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and he talks about what makes a healthy team and what makes a dysfunctional team. I think some of these principles really apply to a church. He talks about healthiness being uh, commitment and trust and accountability and knowing what the goal is. On the flip side, though, the, the dysfunctions of a healthy team, which would apply to us, I think one of them would be invulnerability. One of the dysfunctions of a healthy community is this sense of invulnerability. We can't be honest with each other. We can't, we can't let each other see our weaknesses or our struggles. We have to hold up this pretense of being invulnerable. And that is probably nowhere more common than it is in a church. Because we know the standard and the calling that Christ has in our lives. But yet, we also know what we really go through every day of the week. And so, invulnerability is when I sort of have to live up to this perfection standard. And if I don't, I at least have to fake it when I'm around other people who think I should be living up to it. And they're faking it too. And so we come into a church without being able to talk about the real stuff because we think that if we are vulnerable and if we are weak, we won't know how to handle each other. There will only be judgment or there will only be kind of shunning or, or ridicule but a healthy community where we love one another allows for our reality to come into community and for us to have grace and encouragement. For us to say, you know what? Where you are is okay. Let's go forward. Let's move on. Let's help. Let's let God work in our lives. That sense of invulnerability is one of those dysfunctions that I think uh, more and more we are becoming a vulnerable community, not not, um, not weak, actually. That's not weakness. It's a sign of strength. To be able to share honestly and be rooted enough in what we already know is true to share the stuff that we don't really love about ourselves. 
Another dysfunction that he said was the dysfunction of uh, ambiguity. Ambiguity is basically where we, we know we love each other, but we're not sure what we're doing. <laughs> you ever been a part of a team at work that has an ambiguous goal or project? It's very frustrating. Or a, a school project and you're not quite clear on the assignment. And you're going, okay, we're ready to do this. Now, what are we doing again? And somebody chimes in with this idea and this one, and they're just all in different directions. Ambiguity is a real um, health killer. But, and, and again, for churches, amb ambiguity is, is just so common because there's so many important things. We lose sight of the crystal clear focus of what's most important. What are we doing? I want to uh, just highlight some of that really clear, what are we doing at Pathway? What's important? And I want to do that by talking about a few different words, mission, vision, values, strategy, structure. Please don't let those words put you to sleep because they sound like a corporate thing. They're just a way of answering some questions of what are we doing? What are we, what's important? What has God called us to? So the mission, the, the thing that God has given us to do, the way we say it is to share the hope and freedom found in Jesus Christ. You've probably heard that before, but just for the sake of making sure you're awake, let's say that together. Ready? Our mission is to share. That's really simple and easy to remember. That's right. Right on. Now, the vision is a question of if we did that, what would it look like? You know, vision. What would it look like? Where could we go around with our smartphone and take a picture of the vision, the, the mission happening? And the vision is really simple. It's just when we see people taking steps forward on the pathway, we know that they're growing and they're, they're serving and they're doing those things that Jesus is the center of their life and their relationship with him is going forward. So, for instance, when we see somebody who surrenders their life to Jesus for the first time and gets baptized, we can take a picture of it and go, praise God, the mission is happening we see somebody doing something that they intentionally are doing to grow in their relationship with God, like reading the Bible, and they start picking up habits like prayer, or they come to worship regularly, or they get involved in a group, they're trying to grow. And we can look at that and take a picture of that and say, praise God, the mission is happening. We see people serving in new ways or at new depths and giving generously or when they're giving of their time or they join a serve team at church or one that serves outside of the church or when they start investing into other people and helping them grow, we can look at that and say, praise God, the mission is happening. Next question is one of values. And values just means what's important. What's, impor what's so important that no matter where we do things or what we do or who you talk to, these things are always just going to be essential. Like we can't ever let these go. And so for values, I just like to talk about this in terms of three relationships Three kinds of relationships that are just so important we can never let one of them go. One of them is up. The relationship with God is just essential. Like we want everyone, everyone in our church to have a life-giving, real, personal relationship with God. Not just on Sundays, but every day of the week. And in is we, we just want to have real, honest, vulnerable relationships with Christians in the church where we can support each other, talk, pray, live it out in real day-to-day -day time. And the out relationship, that's just a way of saying we want to have relationships with people who are outside of the church, who are still searching for God, who maybe don't have the relationship we have with God yet. And we want to love them through praying for them, caring for them, sharing with them. And we can't ever let any of those go because we'll just be really lopsided and the triangle will fall apart. The next question is, again, fighting ambiguity. The question is, um, how, how do we do the mission? Like, what's the strategy? What, what's, what, what do I do? to help share the hope and freedom we found in Jesus Christ. And our strategy is really simple. In other words, one of the things we do that's real important at Pathway is worship gatherings. Sunday mornings are huge. We gather and we connect, we pray together. A lot of stuff happens and we prioritize our worship time every week. Life groups and serve teams, those are really essential. We know that you're probably not gonna have deep relationships unless you connect with a life group or a serve team. There's lots of different kinds. And then our, our Reaching out strategy is our plus one people, the people that God's put in our life, in our neighborhood, in our community, at our work, that um, are still searching for him and we get to share God's love with them. That's kind of the strategy. And, and in other words, another way to say that is a lot of our strategy is us. It's just us in relationship with each other and with people outside of ourselves. Last question, then we'll move on to something totally different. Uh, last one is just 
structure. And I only put this up just so you can see the flow. Like we have pastors and staff here for the purpose of investing into you and for the purpose of hopefully blessing and encouraging your spiritual growth so that you can bless, encourage, and build up other people in the community. That flow goes outward. It doesn't flow up. It goes out. Every year about this time, I do a um, review of myself. And I ask for a lot of input from people in the church, family members, board members, staff, and just say, how can I get better as a pastor? How can I get better as a person? What blind spots do I have? Help me see things that I don't see. And that's my usually not funnest time of the year. Um, but it's always good, and I always really appreciate the feedback. One of the things that I frequently get in terms of feedback is, um, we'd love more communication. We'd love for you to talk about things that are most important more often. I get this from my wife as well. Sometimes she'll say, you know, like you think about things for months that I don't know you're thinking about, and then you come up with these revelations and decisions that seem like they're, whoa, where'd that come from? Well, I've been thinking about it for months and reading books, and like I attended a seminar, and I like, this is a really well-developed thought and plan. She said, well, maybe you could like bring me in on the journey more, and that would be awesome. And so I'm realizing that is probably a good idea. So this morning, what I'd like to do for a while is I'd just like to bring you in on a little bit of the journey that has been happening for me in the last uh, while. And I think it will be maybe, maybe insightful because there are certain things that are so important and critical and certain things that we do that this might go, oh, yeah, that makes a little bit more sense. And this is part of our story too. So if you're willing to, I'd just like to share some of that journey with you. I want to introduce you to three people that are very uh, influential in my life. The first one, his name is Alex Cecilia. I met Alex about seven years ago, seven or eight years ago. He's a pastor in Mexico City. He's a Mexican pastor in Mexico City. His first language is Spanish, but he's super fluent in English. And the first time I met Alex was in his church in Mexico City. Mexico City is a very, very populated city. And they had recently had an earthquake that literally brought the roof down. Their big, their big facility, their big worship facility, the roof was very heavy, just crashed down. So they're meeting in like a, basically now a courtyard with no roof. So we were down there, uh, I was down there with the church that I was serving at the time and looking at a roof project, but worshiped with them and spent some time with him. And it didn't take me long to realize there's something very strange about this church other than the fact that it didn't have a roof. <laughs> and they had to raise this a million pound tarp every week in, to keep out the rain. But as I hung around with Alex, there's just something very strange about this guy. He's a different kind of person. As I hung around with the people in his church, there was a vibe that's hard to describe, but it was very contagious. And so what I watched happen was a, 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 a fruit of what happened in his heart a long time ago. He told me the story when he came to this church there were about 80 people, years ago, 80 people in the church, and it was kind of a traditional church that expected the pastor to do the ministry and the people to receive the ministry, and if they didn't like it, they'd tell them to do it a little different, and it was kind of this, you know, restaurant mentality, and he did that for three years, and then he said he got so frustrated that the mission of God was not moving, that he just said, I can't do this anymore, I cannot do this anymore. So what he did was he picked 12 people in his church, and he invited them to meet with him every week for two hours a week for one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Now, you can do the math in your head. That about killed him <laughs> for two years. He met with these 12 people two hours a week, one-on-one, -on -one, discipling these people. And he said after two years, the entire culture of the church started to change because these 12 people now became leaders. Their faith wasn't Sunday faith. It was personal, grounded relationship with Jesus. They were on fire to see God change their lives and let him, uh, let him use them to be a part of changing other people's lives. And so immediately when these people started finishing discipleship, they got somebody else and they said, hey, why don't we get together and meet for discipleship and really go deeper into God and help walk the faith journey with you. And so they began to disciple other people. Fast forward this a few years, that 80 people is now a church of probably now it's into the six or eight hundreds, maybe a thousand. And that's not, the, that's not the weird part about it. You can find a lot of churches like that. What's weird about it is when you go to one of their churches or when you go to their, one, of the, one of their church plants, 
You're not assaulted, but you are, you're immediately connected. There's a sense of like you can't make it from the door to the front without somebody in the church, not a pastor, connecting with you and without saying, hey, I want to introduce you to so-and-so. Hey, tell me your story. And if you're, if, you're, if you're open to it, we would love to get together this week with you and just hear about your spiritual journey. Let's get coffee and hear what's going on. We'd love to connect with you if you want to grow. And all of a sudden, almost by habit, people reach out and begin connecting and investing into one another's lives. This happens all the time. I sat in one of the congregants' houses. It's a super small house. The whole house was probably smaller than this stage. It was a super small house. His name was Lalo. He's a construction worker. And he was sitting there telling me a story through a Spanish and English interpreter. And he was saying that he got to know Alex because uh, he was a drunk, street brawling guy. And he got beat up really bad, put in the hospital. And so Alex visited him. And through the course of time, realized that there's something to this Jesus thing. And so he ended up surrendering his life to Jesus and being discipled and now this guy leads several life groups and he's a leader over several life group leaders and everyone in the, those groups are discipling other people. He, he helped plan a church and I just watch him in action. I'm like, these guys know how to connect with people. This is what Alex taught me. This is the insight. A super healthy church builds disciples at the individual level. Because this, this is not wrong, but this is how most churches do it, and this is how most American churches approach church. They say, hey, let's start a church. And so what they do is they get a pastor, they get a building, they get somebody with some musical talent, they set up a program structure, and then they say, okay, now let's get people to come to church, right? Let's get people to come to the, the programmatic thing, and then if we can really eventually convince them to go to some sort of smaller group, that would be awesome. And then eventually we hope to pick up some spiritual practices and maybe even the elite get mentored or something. And that's, it's not bad. God's worked through that in tremendous ways. But let's flip this and see the power of what happens when we actually know how to walk with a person in their own spiritual journey and, and get into the real life of saying, okay, you're a, you're a person. What's it like with God? How can we walk forward through this? How, how are you dealing with temptation? How are you dealing with struggle? Let's meet together. Let's play, pray. Let's take the individual as a unit and learn how to make disciples well. You take a dozen of those people and put them in a life group and you've got a really strong life group full of 12 leaders who could start their own groups immediately. And you take a life group like that and make five life groups like that and there you've got a church and that's easy to multiply because you've got a bunch of disciples in the church. In our church, uh, I, I along with some others have been praying for several years that we would be able to have a more effective connection with our Spanish speaking neighbors. There's about five or 6,000 people in our county that speak Spanish. And just praying, um, I got introduced to a couple of really strong spiritual leaders who are both Spanish speakers, uh, Jose Cardenas and his family and Marcos Alvarez and his family. They've begun to come and lead our Spanish ministry. And that's the approach. Like those, those guys are both church planting kind of guys. And so the approach is we're not going to start a big program and try to get people to it. Connect with some people. Disciple some people in this community. Help them find Jesus and grow. And then start a group. And then once you have a life group, multiply that group a couple of times. Develop some leaders. And once we have two or three life groups, we will talk about planning a church. Let's talk about it. But let's not flip the script. Because we want to actually help people become disciples. And so sometimes... Um, pretty comfortable with asking you, hey, would you be willing to meet with this person? I think you'd be a great match. Goodness gracious, you'd be so much better than any of our pastors to do this because you have similar life experience. I don't know how to do it. Yes, you do. We'll, we'll help. We'll help. We'll help disciple you so you can disciple other people. Because that's the power of individual discipleship. Next person I want to introduce you to is named John. John Wimber. He's been dead for a while. I've never met him, only through his students and his books. Uh, but God really used his writing to change my life a lot in the last several years. I grew up in a denomination that was fairly similar to this one. It was not charismatic, and it was very Jesus-loving and very good Bible teaching, and I loved Jesus my whole life. But what John Wimber challenged me, and really it was the Holy Spirit for, for a while, is um, 
to change my understanding of what ministry is like. In other words, I would have described my mode of ministry as, God, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to give my best effort in sermon prep and counseling and whatever I'm doing and kind of heave it out there and can you bless it? <laughs> like on the way down before it hits them, can you like shower it with some sprinkling of blessing of your Holy Spirit? And that's exhausting. Like so exhausting. It's so exhausting ministering out of a sense of my own ability, which I have mostly been trained and operated in doing. And what I've been learning over the last several years is the Holy Spirit is actually the one that brings change. The Holy Spirit is actually the one that um, is the power in all of this. And he can use any of us and work through any of us in profound ways the more yielded we are to him. So let me tell you how this started. Um, it started with three topics that were all theoretically very comfortable for me. Healing, physical healing, um, spiritual deliverance, in other words, demonic deliverance, and, um, well, those were the main two. Preaching was one of them too. But. And so, uh, like I said, theoretically, I had a theology of healing and deliverance. Practically, I had nothing else to say about it. Because I just thought everything I'd seen of that was super weird. Super weird. And I don't want to be super weird. So um, there, was a, there was a real intense time of conviction from the Holy Spirit for a while where um, I felt like God wanted me to take some steps of faith and pray for people to be healed. And I was really uncomfortable with that. I was so uncomfortable with this. I'm like, I could sort of make up a sermon on my own. Nobody wouldn't really know if it was great or not. I mean, they'd know, but like, I can't manufacture healing at all. I can't do this at all. And yet, uh, conviction of God was so strong, I just couldn't get away from it. And then I read Wimber about his, when he started this whole thing. He was like me. He grew up with, he was, he was very educated. He was a church leader in many ways, but all of this stuff of the Holy Spirit, he just, it was a closed book for him. He just never did anything like that until God kept nudging. He did a 10, no, he, he, I think he preached for like 10 months at his church on healing. And he just couldn't get away from it. God would not let him stop. And they had no healings for 10 months. And so every week he would invite people up to be, you know, pray for healing. 10 weeks, most of the people left his church. They were just fed up. Like they, they were just tired of healing, hearing about healing and nobody was actually healed. And so he was at the point of just desperation before God began to move and, and do things that now um, many, many people have been affected by the spirit through his ministry. And so I felt like, oh my goodness, this is, this is ridiculous. I'm going to start praying for people for healing. And I, I read in one of these books that uh, one of these guys made a kind of a deal with God and said, well, I'll pray for 50 people for healing. And if you go 0 for 50, I'll stop. <laughs> like if you don't heal 50 people in a row, I'm just going to consider this is not my thing. I'm going to stop praying for healing. And so I thought that is a fair deal. Like I'm not a math guy, but I can count to 50. And then it's sort of up to God, you know. And so I, I went into this going, okay, I didn't make it to 10 before somebody came back and said, just the thing you prayed is exactly what happened physically, medically. I feel so much better. Thank you. And then I started to count over because I'm like, okay, well, now we'll start back at one. But if we go another 50, I'm still done. And I didn't make it to 10 again. And I just had this whole renewal in my life of this realization that God is, God is powerful and real. His spirit is here and he loves us beyond measure. I'd love to tell you story after story about um, people ha experiencing God's healing. And some of it was physical, some of it was emotional, some of it was both. Uh, but I won't tell those stories right now. Um, but what that taught me was um, I, I, I'm a little more confident in the power of God now. Like he, when, he, when God is present and working, our lives can change. Sometimes I feel like we go to church year after year, but we still have the same issues. Sometimes physical, but a lot of times spiritual, and a lot of times baggage and hurts and wounds and unforgiveness and grudges and all these things. But that doesn't have to go on anymore. God actually can speak through people and use the power of his Holy Spirit to minister through average people like you and me to change lives. And so it's given me this totally different perspective on, hey, do you want to pray? Like, that's a dangerous question. Because where God is, things change. 
And it's also given me a huge um, perspective on when God doesn't answer the healing prayers the way I want or the way somebody else wants. Uh, totally changed my perspective on that because I don't feel like a failure anymore. Because, because God can heal and he's not healing, that gives me all the more confidence that if he's choosing not to heal, he is doing something else that we have to key into. He may not be healing my body. And I've seen, man, I've seen this from so many people in our church. I, now when I go to the hospital, and yeah, I'd love to pray for healing. I'd, I'd be glad to do that. And it's happened a bunch. But more, more than that, it's probably not happened the way I've prayed that. But now I'll ask questions like, how's God shown up since you've been in the hospital? And I'm amazed to hear. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not fishing for answers. I'm just amazed to hear what people say about the grace and the power of God at work in their life in their lowest times. Third person I want to introduce to you is... Um, his name is Steve, Steve Addison. I met Steve a few years ago in Europe in a country called Slovenia. Steve Addison was the keynote speaker and the, the event was like a, a missions conference. A bunch of missionaries from around the world were gathered in this conference. It was a Wesleyan conference and there were Wesleyan missionaries. And I was part of the team that was helping care for and pray for the missionaries. And Steve comes in and I'm, you know, like, he just was so underwhelming it was painful. He's this big keynote speaker. He's wrote a bunch of books, and he, he talks about movements and everything. And he comes in to a, a group of professional missionaries, like a whole room full of 100 professional missionaries who have left their homes. Most of them have, like, degrees in mission and Christian ministry. And he goes, okay, I want you to share your story with somebody. And so... He's teaching us how to share our story with someone in the room in like a minute. Like that, the story of how God changed our lives. And then after that, amazingly, he reached up into his PhD experience and taught us how to share the gospel with people in a room full of missionaries who have devoted their lives to being missionaries. And what was astounding to me about this was we didn't know how to do it. <laughs> Like, here's a room full of professional missionaries that are struggling to share the gospel with someone. Or like if, if asked or given the opportunity, had a kind of hard time sharing their story clearly about how God changed my life. And then I realized as, as he was doing this, this guy's super educated and he's written a lot of books, but he's teaching us some simple tools that we don't know how to use very well. Like that room could have written that room could have written articles and publications on how to be a missionary. But some of the most simple tools that are highlighted in the Gospels again and again about being witnesses, we were struggling. What Steve taught me is that... Uh, I actually want to read a quote from him. He says, Christ gave, the God, Christ gave the Great Commission to every disciple, not professionals. Every disciple is charged with making disciples by going, baptizing, teaching. Every disciple has the word, the spirit, and the responsibility to fulfill the mission. And this was real insightfulness to me. Because... I'm one of those people who's taken a lot of classes about it too. But then when you talk about, uh, like, like John Wimber said, it's not just about us being biblically literate, it's about us being biblically obedient. Boy, that's hard to hear if you're a pastor. And a, 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 another one of my favorite Wimber quotes is, faith is spelled like this, R-I-S-K. It gets much easier to just study the thing than do it. And what Steve and Michelle demonstrated is it's actually not hard to share the gospel with people. It's actually not that hard to say things like, uh, yeah, Jesus totally changed my life. When I was this and this and this, he did this and this and this, and it's made a huge difference. That's not hard to say in conversation. So I came back, and that really revolutionized the idea of simple, reproducible tools. That is what we need. If I said today, hey, let's all go out and like share the hope and freedom found in Jesus Christ with people and said, who's with me? 
Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's see. We, we, do, we, do we think that's good? Yeah, let's do it. And then you go and you're like, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> We're sharing the hope of freedom. Like, okay, but what are we doing? As opposed to saying, okay, let's take a minute, write down the names of the people that you know that are not connected to a church. They're struggling. They're searching for God. You're not sure where they are in their faith. And let's pray for them. Like, okay, I can do that. I know how to do that. It's easy. I could, I could imagine myself doing it. Okay, now those people that you wrote down this week, reach out to them and just care for them in some practical way. Don't ask for anything. Don't try to manipulate anything. Just show care for them. Do it in a way that's normal to you. Like if you like to bake, bake them something. If you write cards, write them a card. If you like to fix things, offer to change their oil for them if they, they may need that. Just care for them in some way. Oh, I, I could do that. Hey, great. Next time you see them, just ask them, hey, is there anything that you'd like to pray about today? You're on my mind today. I pray for you often. Is there anything you'd like to pray? I could do that, but I don't want to. <laughs> but I could. And this is where I got. This is, this is where this catches up with me in the last year. The last year, I've just been under uh, tremendous pressure, and I don't like to use that word, but it's been tremendously unsettling from God in my personal life, in my personal life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the invulnerability dysfunction here for a moment and just share a little bit about this last year. So I got to the point where I realized I've been living in my house for like five years, and I've, you know, we've had some block parties with our neighbors, and we've gotten to know them, but I don't think I've actually mentioned Jesus hardly ever with people. And it just sort of, it just sort of caught up to me like, at what point do I think they're all just going to come knock on my door and say, hey, Jared, can you tell us about Jesus? Like, that would be awesome. But it hasn't happened. And there's something inside of me that just kind of thought, well, if I'm magically a good person, they will magically come and ask me about all this stuff. And I look at the life of Jesus, I'm like, actually, he was the one who went to people. He traveled quite a bit to every town and village. He met people where they were. He went into homes. He didn't sit in the synagogue and wait for people. Now I look at the lives of people like John Wesley, who catalyzed this huge movement. And he didn't sit in the Church of England in their structure and wait. He went to people at their break rooms at the factory and, and in, in where kids were being uh, worked to death in, in institutions. And he shared the gospel with people where they were. And so this, this, this thought just continued to really challenge me, guys. I, it was to the point where I just thought, am I going to like do this? Because I can't keep talking about it. Am I going to actually be intentional to make disciples and share the gospel? Or am I just going to kind of wait for people to come? It was a real big crisis moment for me because I had a real clear line of excuses as to why I won't, can't, and don't. I'm a pastor. My job is equipping the people who are already Christians to go do something that I myself am not doing. <laughs> my job, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. Like, I don't like to hang out in all these social environments, and my kids aren't in sports yet, and I don't know. Like, all these, all these excuses, and it just got to the point where the discomfort from the Holy Spirit was worse than the discomfort of doing something. You know, like the pain of not doing something was worse than the pain of doing it. So I, I remember I was in my office there one day and I'm like, I know what to do. I just don't want to do it. Actually, I, I, I practiced through. I've walked through. I'm very comfortable with sharing the gospel with people. I'm very comfortable with praying with people. I'm very comfortable with if they just give me the finger and say, leave me alone. I'm okay with that. Like I know, I, I just know, be like, okay. And it's not going to damage the relationship. It's okay. And I'm okay if they say, I've got questions. I kind of know what to do. And if they say, yeah, I want to move forward. I know what to do. What's my problem? And, and my problem was just fear. It was total fear. I thought, oh my gosh. If I talk about this stuff, if I talk about Jesus in settings that aren't here, I know some people are going to be really mad at me. I'm not sure who they are. But I'm just sure. I'm going to have some family members that are going to be furious if I share gospel with another family member that I have that I've known my whole life. And they know I'm a pastor. But I've never shared the gospel. And I know that I know where they are. They're not in a good place. And so I, I paced the room. I mean, I, I paced this room for a long time and said, okay, like, am I embarrassed of Jesus? I think I'm embarrassed of Jesus. I think I am. I think I don't want people to make fun of me if they think that I'm actually with Jesus. And Jesus said a few things about that and they weren't kind. 
if you're embarrassed of me, guess what? I'm going to be embarrassed of you. And I don't want that. And so I didn't know what to do. I, seriously, I did not know what to do, but I knew I had to do something. So I just started by walking. I said, I'm going to walk out my door, literally put my shoes on, walk out my door, and prayer walk my street for seven days in a row. So I just walked out my street, walked up and down, prayed for every neighbor by name as I walked by. They didn't see me. Just did it for seven days in a row. I thought, okay, that was, that was good. Like, I could do that. Now I'm going to walk and actually pray with people. That was a lot harder. So I walked out, and I wasn't going to knock on doors. I was just going to, if I saw somebody, I was going to introduce myself and offer to pray for him. And I don't know that this was a great strategy. Like I said, I didn't know what to do. I was just doing something because I couldn't keep doing the nothing that I had been doing. And so I walked out, and the first person I see, I, I shared this story a while ago. The first person I see is a lady sitting on our front porch and sat down with her. And we talked for just a minute. I introduced myself. She was very kind. There was no awkwardness to it. I didn't intrude at all. She was, she was just having a cigarette. So I sat down beside her, and we talked. And, and I asked her if there was anything I could pray for her about. And I shared this with me before. She said, yeah, my son was just murdered. Please pray for me. And I just, I was shocked, not, not just about what she said, but I was shocked that she wanted prayer. And then over the next several weeks, I just made this commitment of like, you know what, I want to do this every week, at least once a week. I just want to be where people are and pray with them. And so I started walking my neighborhood on walks, and if I saw somebody, I'd offer to pray with them. And here's what shocked me. It, it didn't shock me for the people who didn't want anything to do with me. I expected that to be everybody. There were a few people that just said, no, I'm fine. Okay, nice to meet you. What shocked me was the majority of people who immediately had requests, they were thrilled to pray about them, and they started tearing up when we talked about God. What surprised me is how natural it was in conversation with strangers, and they were telling their story to just share stories about how God had changed my life or other people's lives in similar ways that they're struggling with right now. That's what surprised me. And I just thought, man, I can... I don't mind the, the miss for the hit. That, like, God is at work in people's lives. And so I started this little home Bible study in my house because I'm like, if my neighbors want to connect and grow in their relationship with God, they may not be ready to go to a church. So I started this, relationship, uh, this, this thing in my house, this Bible study, for six weeks. And from week one, there was zero people. Well, count me in, there was one. By week six, there were zero people. And I'm thinking, okay, uh... I hit a point of major discouragement. I'm like, okay, this has, this has resulted in lots of good connection with prayer. I've shared the gospel with a number of people in my neighborhood. I've shared my story. Uh, I've built relationships with people. But there's been nobody interested in moving forward. And, and then I was like, all right, I, I wonder how many. Like, if I get to 50, I'm quitting. <laughs> so I counted them. I went through, because I made a list of everybody I was praying for. And I went through them like, like, we're at 50. I'm done. I'm so dis I'm just so I'm just so deflated here. I'm done. I'm tired of this. Cuz it's nice to pray with people. I mean that's easy. But we're you know, the discipling thing, nobody. For everybody that I invited, people said they'd come. Nobody's interested. So I counted back and I'm like, I'm at 50. I'm done. About that time, one day after church, I did a tour with some people who were newer to the church and said, hey, let's just do a tour of the building. And I love doing this. Just show people where things are at. And we got to the wall, the pathway wall, where the stages of the pathway are there. And I said, hey, here's what the stages are. Here's what they mean. We talk about the pathway, so this is what it means. And I said, where would you put yourself on the path if you, if you had to identify a stage? You know, I'm just sharing the gospel with people and just telling them what we do. And one guy in the tour goes, well, I'd put myself in the searching stage. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm ready for this. <laughs> and so I said, well, is there anything that's holding you back from surrendering your life to Jesus? And he goes, I just, I just have a lot of questions. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm ready for that too. And I go, okay, well, would you like to get together and look at some stories about Jesus and talk through those questions? And he's like, yeah, I'd love to. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is great. So we exchanged numbers and we got together. We got together at a coffee shop and we looked at Jesus' stories. We read them, we talked about them, we talked, he shared about his life. I shared the gospel with him and said, 
you know, are you ready to take that step forward? And he's like, nope. Okay, do you want to get together again next week? Yeah, I'd love to. So we got together again for another week. We talked about the story of Jesus, the grace, the prodigal son, the, the, the righteous man and the sinner who are praying and God validates the sinner instead of the one who thinks he's righteous and the grace of God to, to find people in their own brokenness. And I said, hey, here, you know, here's the gospel. He goes, I'm ready to take that step. I want to give my life to Jesus. And I'm just going, for real? Because <laughs> this isn't in Sunday. It's not Sunday. And I'm not wearing a mic. I'd love to pray with you. And so we prayed. And he had a family member who's sitting right there who's still searching too and wasn't ready. And so we prayed. And then I'm like, okay, this dude has just surrendered his life to Jesus. He's got a really, really different past. Like he's, he didn't grow up in church. He's got a very different past, very different, difficult changes. And he started transforming. Like his life started changing. And, and I just didn't want to like go, okay, well, we prayed. Um, I said, hey, would you like to get together for like six weeks and walk through some of the stuff that we've been doing? Study the Bible together, learn about Jesus, become like Jesus, obey Jesus. He goes, yeah, I'd love to do that. So we started meeting up every week one-on-one -on -one and doing a very simple, just discovering what Jesus said and what he did and then talking about how we're applying it, being honest with each other. I shared my life with him. He shared his life with me. He, uh, we prayed for each other. And in a short window of time, I'm like, this guy had so much life change, it's unbelievable. He was in jail not long ago. And now he wrote a letter for me to take into the jail to, to share Jesus with all these other people. And he's been sharing with his probation officer. And like, he's just excited. And I just, got, I just went, okay, I think he was number 50 or 51, but it doesn't matter because something happened. Right about that time, I was doing some business in the 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 Justice Building and met the new sheriff, Sheriff Dukes, did a tour of the jail and they started asking, we just had conversations about ideas and they asked me to teach a class on spirituality in the jail. I thought, well, that's cool. Um, kind of open field, like just teach whatever you want. It's a 12 week class and so I found myself talking, uh, meeting a room of about 10 or 12 men every week and talking about Jesus. And at the beginning, the, the first week, I would say zero of those people would have said they're following God with their lives. Like a lot of, I believe in God, but not z like zero, I'm following God or I, you know, I'm committed to Jesus. There was zero. After a week, um, one of the guys in a cell at night surrendered his life to Jesus. And then after about five or six weeks, there was one particular day where, um, and, and these guys had become friends at this point, and there was one particular day where we were talking about behavior change and then talking about the gospel like the gospel is not fix your life the gospel is surrender your life to Jesus so that he can work inside of you I know I'm going long I'm almost done but there was just something that was happening in the room at the moment and we were talking about surrender we were talking about receiving forgiveness we were talking about giving forgiveness and it's like the room got really heavy and I could tell that everyone was in, you know, like a lot of times you're just waiting for this guy to stop talking. <laughs> but this was one of those moments where I'm like, okay, God is doing something right now. So I just stopped and I, I'm like, guys, let's just stop for a minute. Is there anybody in the room right now who you want to surrender your life to God? You want to do that today? Guy raises his hand. Like, okay. Is there anybody who you know you've been holding a grudge and you want to forgive someone today? Two other guys raise their hand. I'm like, okay, class is over. And we just kind of dismissed. Of course, they didn't leave the room. We're, we're all in the same room. But sat down with the first guy, and he was just like, yeah, God was speaking to me last night in my cell, in my room. And this verse came up, and then you said the same verse, and it's like God was speaking to me. I'm like, yeah, he is. He loves you. He wants, he wants to have your life. And so I'm like, okay, would you like to pray and surrender your life to God? He's like, yeah, I don't know how. I'm like, that's okay, I'll help you. So we prayed this simple prayer, and he gave his life to Jesus. He committed his life to Jesus. He changed, you know, confessed his sin. And then the next guy and the, and the next guy, this forgiveness, deep forgiveness was happening, and, and we prayed through some deep hurts and holds that had been on this, these people's lives for a while. And I was just amazed to see, man, wow, this is, this is tremendous. Like, again, some of those lessons came to bear. 
God's power is here, and there are some simple things that we can do to help people become disciples of Jesus. Toward the end of the class, last week, the last week of the class, uh, by now these guys have become, like I said, friends, and um, we're sitting around after class and listening to this song. We're listening to this song, and it's a song about hope and the second chance we get in Jesus called Start Over. And there are four or five of us huddled around listening to this song. And I'm in tears because... I, I see what's happening in the lives of these guys. There's been so much movement spiritually in the last, and it wasn't just me. There's was a lot of people investing into them. But at the end, I just uh, I looked over this one guy who who's the first to surrender his life to Jesus and said, "Hey, I don't know, but I just I just see you as a church leader, man. I just think God has a plan for your life. I don't know what exact role, but I just see that in you." And he comes up to me two days later and he goes, "Hey, Jared, what classes do I have to take to be a pastor?" And I was like, what, what do you mean? He's like, what, what do I have to take to be a pastor? You know, when you said that, that's right. I want to be, I think that's what God wants for my life. What do I need to do? I'm like, that's fantastic. That's great. And then um, that led to an invitation to, uh, from the sheriff to be the jail chaplain. And we had that conversation end of last year. And basically he said, hey, I want you to oversee all the ministry programming, all the current ministry programming, bring in some new ministry programming, bring in new volunteers and connect in the jail. I thought, what an, op what an amazing opportunity. There's some great people and great things happening. This is, this is great. So talked about it with my family, friends, board, staff, prayed about it and just felt like I need to say yes and said sort of, hey, I can only do this much. This is my capacity. I have to honor the the number one priority in my life that God's given me, which is my family. And I still want to do the best I can at being a pastor at Pathway. But I'd love to do this on a volunteer basis. If, you, if that's what you want, yeah, we'll do it. And so that started. And I'm just telling you, it's um, every week there are a lot of people that I have the opportunity now to go to where they are and talk. And they want to talk to me. It's strange because six months ago, I couldn't find one person that wanted to be invested in or discipled. Now it's the exact opposite. I can't find enough time. And so it's bringing back this whole concept of simple reproducible tools that everybody gets to use and participate in. I debated sharing a lot of that story with you today because it's long and it's kind of personal and you can go, well, that wasn't a three-point sermon at all. I, the, the whole last series on Jesus School is a lot of, lot of sermon stuff. But I just wanted to share some of my journey, partly so you can know and pray for me. Um, honestly, I feel like every week at the end, I pray and send you, and there's a part of me that just feels like I need you to send me. Um, I, just, I just need your prayers. And would, love, would love to just uh, know that you're praying. And we each have our own different place that we serve, you know, and, and that, the jail happens to be one of them, but there's a lot of other places that you make a difference in. I just wanted to ask for that prayer and support. And the second reason is uh, because some of those things that are really important to me, I, I know are not exactly your story. I know they're not your story. But I think that the, the things that Jesus said apply to us all. And some of those spelling faith, R-A-S-K, apply to us all. And I know that God has been stirring in many, many hearts in our church. And so I just want to do my best to a, lead by authentic example and sometimes my uh, mistakes or foolishness. And B, do everything I can to help give you the tools that you need to build the kingdom. Simple tools that you can use and you can help other people use as we continue to fulfill the Great Commission in the spirit of the Great Commandment. I'd like to pray for you. Jesus, thanks for all the things that you've given us to celebrate. They are many. The first of which is just that you love us. Not because we're great, not because we deserve it, but you love us right where we are. In fact, in our very worst, that's the place you love us most because you have to come to find us. We can't even find you. But you love us and you save us and you make us new. You forgive us, you heal us, you bring us life, you give us purpose. We just, we just celebrate who you are. And I want to thank you personally and celebrate for all the ways that you've challenged me and others to continue to grow even in the places where we'd rather stick to what we know. And God, for those 
in this room. You have a plan and purpose for everyone's life. We don't have to manage each other's life because, Spirit, we believe that you're the guide, you're the counselor, you're the teacher. But I pray that we would be obedient. Pray that we would be followers of what you're doing in our lives. And God, before we wrap up and share communion, I just want to keep praying the same prayer that we've been praying for years, that you would um, let us be involved in building your kingdom in our community. Two-thirds of our community don't have a church. Uh, Many, many people do not have hope or freedom at all, or very little of it. And so you have us. We just just ask that you keep using us in the ways that would... (laughs) share hope and freedom. In Jesus' name.